top business stories live from the Sky News City Studio. The price of car insurance rises by 43% in a year as MPs are told costs are deterring drivers from making claims. As electric vehicle sales growth slows, I'll be speaking to the chief executive of one of the earliest providers of EV charging in the UK. Plus, the world's fifth biggest economy, India, goes to the polls tomorrow with 969 million people eligible to vote. Good afternoon. This is Business Live with me, Ian King. The average annual car insurance bill is now so high that drivers are being deterred from making claims and the soaring premiums are very hard to justify. That was what the Financial Conduct Authority's head of insurance told MPs yesterday. And further evidence of soaring premiums comes today with data from the comparison service Confuse.com, which reports that the average cost of car insurance is now £941 a year after increasing by £284, that's 43%, in the last 12 months. Well, earlier I spoke to Confuse.com's chief executive, Steve Dew. A lot of it is driven by uh, rising insurer costs. That's both the, the a lot of that is driven by claims. So that's both the frequency of claims and then the cost of claims. Um, particularly driving the cost of claims are things like uh, vehicles uh, becoming more sophisticated and the technology being more expensive to replace. Uh, Labour has increased in the past couple of years. Um, and we've seen some historic rises in car insurance premiums up to the numbers you've mentioned over the last 18 months. In the last quarter, though, we have seen the average price drop by £54 uh, to uh, around £950. Um, so there looks to be some respite in the growth. Um, too, too early to call, uh, to call that a success, though, as overall prices are still very high, as you said, and uh, consumers are feeling the pinch here. Um, and in other areas of their lives. Some other business news stories for you now. And the controversial music investment company Hypnosis Songs has agreed to a takeover by rival, valuing it at £1.4 billion. Hypnosis was launched in 2018 with the idea of buying the rights to songs and exploiting their intellectual property rights in films, TV shows and computer games. It currently owns 138 in, uh, catalogues with more than 40,000 songs by artists including Blondie and Red Hot Chili Peppers, but it has been mired in controversy over the value of those songs and the shares have fallen by 40% in the last two years. The buyer is a company called Concord, which is based in Nashville in Tennessee. EasyJet said today that its half-year losses would be lower than expected. Carrier, which traditionally loses money during the winter months, said it expected to report a pre-tax loss of between £340 and £360 million during the six months to the end of March. That's a £50 million improvement on the same period a year ago. It said this was due to putting on extra capacity on routes where there was stronger demand, as well as the early timing of Easter, during which it said trade was particularly strong. The shares are ahead by some 3% right now. Rent a Kill Initial said today it expects to spend £250 million this year on buying other businesses. The world's largest pest control company said it had done eight deals so far this year already, including the acquisition of High Care Services, the second largest pest control company in India. Rent a Kill sales during the first three months of the year came in at £1.3 billion, up 5% on the same period a year ago, with growth at its strongest in the Pacific region. The shares fell 5% earlier today. They've since recovered somewhat. And Coventry Building Society has agreed a potential takeover of Co-op Bank for up to £780 million. Confirming a report yesterday from Sky City editor Mark Kleiman, the pair said they'd agreed terms with Coventry, the UK's third largest building society, also having carried out substantial due diligence to its satisfaction. Coventry is expected to face questions at its annual meeting next week over its decision not to put the vote, deal to a vote among its near two million members. Now, voting gets underway in India tomorrow. The world's biggest democracy, with an electorate of 969 million people, will have a chance to vote over the next few weeks. India is the world's fifth largest economy and one of the fastest growing. I've been speaking with Elizabeth Scott. She's chair of the £142 million investment trust, India Capital Growth Fund. And I began by asking her what she saw as the big opportunities in India right now. As you know, there's an election coming up. Um, and... I think that the outcome will be very positive for markets and for the Indian economy as a whole. Uh, there's an expectation, I think, that Modi will win a significant victory. 
uh, at when the results are finally announced in early June, and that um, we're going to see more infrastructure being built in India, as, as has happened in the past uh, past few years. So just to give you an example of that, I was in India the other day, so we met the Minister for Roads, uh, the chief civil servant in, in the roads department, and, and he was telling us about the new road that's in the process of being built between Delhi and Mumbai, 1,350 kilometres, which is about the same distance as London to Rome. Uh, and that is going to cut, it's a high-speed uh, expressway, eight lanes with an option to add another four if necessary in the future and that will cut the journey time for a lorry from 24 hours of driving to 12 hours of driving and reduce the fuel consumption by about 40 percent so can you imagine what sort of impact that's going to have on the efficiency and productivity of an economy like India and their plans are uh, in the next 10 years or so to build another 40 or 50,000 kilometres of roads that are going to have a very similar impact on the Indian economy. So that's just one example of how the productivity in India is going to improve over the next few years. There's obviously been a lot of hype around Indian stocks later. I mean, the financial regulator has gone so far as to call, call the market frothy. Yes, um, and I, I'm sure you could say that in the short term. But I think what we expect to see, and when we went to visit some co companies in India, we definitely saw as well, is that, you know, assuming a growth rate of six, between six and seven percent uh, um, on the Indian economy, um, companies are going to be growing pretty rapidly and their earnings are going to grow very rapidly as well. And the consequence of that is that, um, you know, while valuations may look expensive today, in five years time, they of course will not look anything like as expensive as that. Um, so I think that there's a lot of reason to be optimistic about the Indian stock market over the longer term, even if, the sh even if in the short term there may be a little bit of volatility. Now, you mentioned uh, just now you, you think uh, Modi will be re-elected. Yes. What sort of things will investors specifically be looking for from him? Well, I think they're going to be looking for the continuation of the sort of productivity enhancements that India has been seeing over the past few years. So uh, one, of the, uh, one of the companies that we went to see uh, was Sona BLW, which is a manufacturer of crucial car components for the electric vehicle sector in particular. So as you know, Tesla has announced that they're going to build a factory in India. And uh, the Indian government has been working very hard to encourage the development of that EV ecosystem uh, within India and Sona as part of that. Uh, and so I think that you're going to see companies like that benefit from the Indian government's desire to bring more foreign manufacturers into India uh, and then to build out these ecosystems that will allow these Indian companies to develop into the sort of global champions of their sectors in the future. I mean, Indian companies have been criticised in the not-too-distant past for poor corporate governance. It's been suggested mm. there's a culture of, of crony capitalism. Is, is that improving, in your opinion? Uh, well, we see it improving substantially. Uh, and I think, you know, particularly in the arena of ESG, what we're beginning to see also is companies reporting on it profit. Pro properly. So using Sona as an example, again, um, their ESG reporting has improved substantially. In their peer group globally, they rank very highly if you look at the various different metrics of ESG success. Uh, they rank increasingly highly. And of course, if they're going to compete in the global marketplace with concerns about supply chains, they need to be able to demonstrate to big global companies that they are doing the right thing in India. So I think that those concerns um, can be, can reduce, are reducing, uh, and that Indian companies are fully aware of them and they want to do much better than they have in the past. I mean, India is one of the most unequal societies in the world, and parts of the country have, of course, flirted with communism in the past. Is that something that would worry you as an investor? Uh, not particularly after our visit most recently. Um, I, I think that it, it seemed to me like that you know, the Indians are really enjoying the fruits of the success that the Modi government has, has brought to them. And that's why expectations are that he will be re-elected with, without too much um, 
without too much surprise. Um, you know, there are always going to be uh, pockets of unrest. But, but I think what, what we have seen is that, you know, India is now approaching that magic 3,000 US dollars per head of, uh, of income. Uh, and, and that really means that pe predominantly people's basic needs are being met. And once you get past that $3,000 of, of income per head, uh, people will start to spend on consumer goods. Um, you know, we, we met the manufacturer of, of um, a manufacturer of suitcases. You know, people start to travel, people start to spend money, uh, people start to improve their houses. So I, I, I'm very optimistic about that and the development, you know, I think we will see inequality, of course, uh, but, but hopefully we're seeing some moves to close the gap. A bit of breaking news to bring you that we've had in the last few moments. The Criminal Cases Review Commission has offered an unreserved apology to, for failing Andrew Malkinson, who spent 17 years in prison for being wrongly convicted of rape. The Criminal Cases Review Commission has been reviewing a number of cases, uh, historic cases, uh, given that uh, new evidence involving DNA has uh, come to light. We'll have more on that story throughout the evening here on Sky News. Now, there seems little doubt that global electric vehicle sales growth is slowing, all of which has implications for suppliers, dealers and those involved in EV infrastructure, such as Podpoint, one of the earliest providers of electric vehicle charging in the UK. Well, this morning, the company reported a pre-tax loss of £83 million for 2023. That was up from £20 million in 2022, which was due mainly to non-cash impairment charges. Well, joining me now is Andy Palmer. He's chief executive of Podpoint. Andy, welcome to you. Um, just a word on, on the results. What informed the impairments? Um, we went through a review of the business um, and decided to concentrate our business in future on home and work as opposed to other parts of the business. It's a more profitable segment. It's an area that has higher growth. Most charging is done at home and work. And so we, we had to therefore uh, show some impairment of goodwill uh, which we've, we've done in the results. As you say, it's, it's not uh, relevant to the cash position. And ultimately, our results for, uh, for 2023, I think, uh, have beaten expectations um, and, a, and a, a good, solid evidence of a, of a turnaround in progress. You, your sales were, were down 11%. That, that was due to fewer home uh, installations. Yeah, what you saw, 22 over 23, was the, the, the grant for um, putting a, a charger on the side of your house disappeared. So particularly in the first half, first half of 22 versus first half of 23, a fairly significant reduction in volumes as a result of that. But good news for us is if one compares second half 22 to second half 23, we actually saw growth. So finally recovered from that lack of grants. I would argue that probably the, the grant disappeared a little bit too early. I think the, the report from the House of Lords would agree with me. Uh, but nevertheless, we've survived that and, and, and grown uh, subsequently. Why do you think EV sales appear, growth appears to be slowing around the world? I think ultimately the, the, the people that buy electric cars so far because they're green, they're good for the environment, that represents about 20% of the market. Now you've got to get to the 60% of the market. There's another 20% that perhaps will never buy an electric car. But that 60% of the market is looking for a, a better value. A and it's a fact that today electric cars are expensive, unless you buy Chinese. And we've got to find a solution to that. And in fact, I think there are two things that one has to do. One, firstly, the cost of the cars need to come down and 40% of the cost of the car is the battery, and therefore, ideally, you need smaller batteries. But you're not going to get to a smaller battery if you don't have a prolific network of chargers, and we don't. Secondly, the cost of energy to, to charge those cars needs to come down. And for that, we, we think that the solution comes around something called flex, which is the ability for the charging provider to not charge the car during expensive periods, and charge the car during cheaper periods and therefore pass that benefit onto the consumer. And these two together both involve the charging networks and both involve Podpoint, um, but, but are part of the solution to a greater rollout of electric cars. How unhelpful was the government's decision to delay the ban on manufacturing new petrol and diesel vehicles? Very. Um, very, and it also affects, of course, inward investment because it's confidence uh, on the UK to keep to its intentions. That said, 
there is a, another legislation under, underlying all of this which imposes on the OEMs, on the car manufacturers, that says that in 2024, 22% of your sales needs to be BEV, battery electric vehicles, and by 2030 needs to reach 80%. So the reality is nothing much changes because car makers have to reach 22% of their sales this year. And of course, ultimately, that's helpful to the charge point providers, including Podpoint. What did you make of BP's decision this week to uh, de-emphasise their electric charging business? Interesting, because obviously they've also made the decision to move out of home charging and towards public network charging. Um, again, that's probably around uh, confidence of, of, of rollout. Um, and I think ultimately uh, stepping off the throttle, if I can put it like that, towards electrification only plays into the hands of the Chinese. Andy, we have to live with that. It's been a while since we had you on the programme. It's nice to see you again. Look Thank forward you. to coming back next time. Thank you. Still to come here on Business Live, we'll have a look at how the markets have done this afternoon. Stay with us. I'm just about to start my Tower Power 2024 challenge, um, a sustainable triathlon from... Um, the Leaning Tower of Pisa to the Eiffel Tower to my hometown of Blackpool, uh, all in aid of the Army Cadet Charitable Trust and in memory of little Jordan Banks, who, who tragically lost his life three years ago on a football pitch in, in Blackpool, K. So trying to raise as much funds and awareness as possible. Yeah, so we're going to pop in and say hello to the Eiffel Tower, K, before we head back to the, our homeland, in fact, of Lancashire. Yeah, indeed. So now tell me why it's an eco-triathlon. So I don't know if you can see there, Kay, but there's my bike behind me. Um, and that is a, the, probably the most sustainable bike on the planet. It's been made purely from coppice wood uh, from my local forest in Hampshire. So hazel, birch um, and willow and um, all the panniers on the bike as well. They are made from recycled truck tarpaulin. Um, I'm eating vegan based plant food ration packs, which are compostable. Uh, I'm going to be sleeping, camping uh, in a sustainable tent. Uh, so. Yeah, it's, 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 we're going to try and give a little bit more back to the planet than we're taking. Um, I'm certainly not suggesting I'm, you know, super green by any means. I've been a serial offender of, of climate issues, travelling around the world for many years, all seven continents. But I want to see what we can actually do from a sustainability perspective when we travel. Um, I also want to try and educate myself and educate young people with lots of uh, free online resources on the Tower Power 2024.com website. Super proud to be a national ambassador for the Army Cadets, which for me is one of the, the, the best sort of kept secrets in the United Kingdom and an amazing organization uh, based on the principles of fun, friendship, action, adventure. We get young people outside, which is great for their mental well-being, their physical health. And we also teach them core values like respect, integrity, loyalty, courage, discipline, selfless commitment. So an amazing organization. And I, I, I want to shout from the rooftops or the top of the tower uh, about them. If you forgot your pyjamas, Emirates has got you covered.
fly Emirates, fly better. Thank you. Well, equity markets in Europe have had a positive session today. Here's how they closed on continental Europe, all of the main indices in positive territory. Talking points this afternoon include the Finnish, Finnish telecoms equipment maker Nokia. Its shares up 1.5% on quarterly results. Actually, look at that, nearly 2 and 3 quarter percent uh, higher at the close. Here in London, the FTSE 100 has also finished with its head above water, up uh, nearly two fifths of 1%. The leading blue chip gainer this afternoon, International Airlines Group, the parent of British Airways, of course, that has risen by nearly 5% following the strong results yesterday from United Airlines. Other FTSE gainers include National Grid, which has ridden by 1.5% following a trading update. As ever on the Thursday at this time of year, lots of companies going ex-dividend, in other words, trading without the rights for the first time to the latest payout. Uh, you can see they're on the screen. Croda, BA, Systems and Unite, all lower. Don't worry if you own those, that's just because they've gone ex-div today. Outside the FTSE, Dunelm, the homewares retailer, is off nearly 7.5%. That's after its latest sales figures came in below expectations. Over on Wall Street, it's been a quite quiet session uh, so far. Las Vegas Sands is off 7.5%. That follows a downbeat trading statement from the casino operator to the upside. The home builder, DR Horton, is ahead by 3% following a trading update. On the currency markets, well, sterling has continued to firm after yesterday's inflation figures, up a tenth of 1% against the dollar, quarter of 1% against the euro. Meanwhile, the oil price has continued to drift lower. It's currently at its lowest level for a fortnight. Barrel of Brent crude currently changing hands at $87.17 a barrel. That's off a little over a tenth of 1%. Well, joining me this afternoon is Robert Olster, Chief Investment Officer at Close Brothers Asset Management. Uh, Robert, great to see you. Um, Mentioned uh, rent -a kill earlier in the programme. I mean, I thought it was quite an upbeat trading statement. The shares finished slightly down on the day. No, you're right. Um, it was, I think, quite a good statement, and they're growing sort of mid signal digit organic growth. I guess there was a bit of disappointment in the North American numbers, but you've got to remember they're integrating a very big business there, Terminix. So, um, on the whole, they're still going very well. They're as you saw, they've got um, very good organic growth and inorganic. They're continuing to make um, acquisitions, and that's a key area of growth for rent kill So it's very solid, I think, is the answer. And, of course, benefits overall from climate change. Yeah, and, of course, a much more focused business. I mean, I remember when they bought Initial about sort of 25 yes. years ago, and they became this sort of really rather rambling conglomerate. They seem to be much more focused now. No, you're right. There was always the clothing element, both industry and, and commercial, but it's really being focused now on pest control. And um, that's obviously where they're going forward. You saw they made that acquisition in India. They've got um, businesses in India. So, you know, they're, they're moving to become a genuinely global business, essentially. Yeah, a British world leader, no less. Now, yes. what about National Grid? I thought it was quite sparse mm. on detail, I thought, this one. Yeah, National Grid trading statement. So, it's a bit smoke and mirrors, in a way, because it's about a sort of deferred tax issue which the government introduced to stimulate capital expenditure. And National Grid are basically saying, look, we've got to look at underlying earnings, you've got to forget about the tax. So actually, the economic value, if you like, of National Grid hasn't changed. They're just sort of clarifying what to look for in future numbers. But of course, a great beneficiary going forward of electric vehicles, of the whole energy transition. So that's, that's their future. Yeah, and I mentioned Don Elm in the market report there. I mean, something of a stock market darling for a while, but it seems to have kind of lost a bit of a following, lost some of its fan club. Yeah, exactly. Um, it has done. I mean, it's household furnishings. And I think what spooked people is this comment that, you know, the UK consumer is still a bit wobbly, as it were, and March a bit weak, so people, I think, have fastened onto that. But arguably interest rates in the UK to come down at some point this year, that should help the UK consumer. So I think people are just trying to think, well, what exactly is going to happen in the sort of the rest of this year to um, the consumer stocks such as Donnell? Yeah, now it's been a busy day for corporate updates. Another one that caught your eye was Deliveroo. Yes, so Deliveroo, everyone looking at what's happening with the numbers there, good numbers sort of in line, slightly above in terms of consensus, but the growth area really being international, so international, sort of plus two, UK down, and it's France. 
that's sort of recovering. Again, another consumer stock, another one to watch for the future, for the rest of the year, given the interest rates coming down. Yeah, well, obviously way below its IPO price, and that alienated a lot of people. I get the sense from what you're saying that you think it's, it's kind of um, people are taking a fresh look at it. Yeah, I, I think so. Um, I mean, there's also the issue of Kentucky Fried Chicken losing that contract or them withdrawing. It's a very competitive area of the market, though, with Just Eat and Uber Eats coming in. So yeah, you've got to be careful, I think. You've got to sort of think very, very seriously about how the competitive dynamics of this particular industry is going to play out. Well, quite so. Yeah, a bit of a credibility uh, gap to uh, rebuild, I guess. Yes, very much so, compared to the IPO. But that was, in some ways, unfortunate timing um, in view of what happened in the pandemic and yeah. the pandemic stops going up and then easing off. OK, Robert, we've got to leave it there. Good to see us over this afternoon. Thank you. That's it from me. I'm back again with Business Live tomorrow morning at half past 11. Hope very much to see you then. In the meantime, do stay tuned. Coming up next, it's Mark Austin with the News Hour. Thanks for joining me this afternoon. Cheerio.